Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Professor Mary Horgan. I'm president of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, and I am a consultant in infectious diseases at Cork University Hospital. A very warm welcome um, to you as the public who we serve as, as, as doctors, pharmacists uh, and so on. Uh, we're delighted that you can join us today um, and hope that we can share our mutual experiences. We are using a new platform, um, which is similar to Zoom, slightly different. In it, there is a, um, a function for questions and answers, and we really are keen that we get those questions in, in um, to us so that you can uh, participate actively in the evening. I'm delighted to introduce the chair of the evening. Uh, that's the vi our v vice president in the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, Professor Mary Higgins. Mary is a UCD graduate of 2000. She did her training in obstetrics and gynaecology in Ireland and then took, undertook a master's in the University of Oxford and subsequently did further training in Canada in uh, maternal and fetal medicine. She is, uh, has had several media appearances, but more importantly is a frontline cl uh, clinician in Hollis Street where she is a huge advocate for women's health and the safe delivery of that. So Mary, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to introduce the uh, format and the speakers. Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome to our meeting today and thank you, President, for the introduction. I've just come from the maternal medicine clinic in the National Maternity Hospital where we're providing care to women who are pregnant with chronic conditions. And the principles that we work with today are going to be a lot of the principles we're going to be talking about this evening. That is of person-centered care, of individualization of care, of what's important to the person as well as the clinicians in setting goals, the importance of every member of the multidisciplinary team. The more I work with really good people on a multidisciplinary team, the more important I realize is it is so valuable to have dietitians and occupational therapists and physiotherapists and how important it is to listen to the person who's in the center of this and to remember what's important for them and what do they need to get out of this. We have a really exciting meeting today with lots of fantastic people. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to cycle through all the presentations, which I'm really looking forward to. So we're starting off with John Brennan, who's a GP, Kathy Carroll, a patient, Liam Plant from Nephrology. You know Hagen, a pharmacist, Kevin Connolly, um, a paediatrician who's going to talk about vaccines, Noel McCaffrey, um, the founder of X1 Medical, and Kim Gowan, a dietitian. So multiple members from everybody in the teams that provide care. So we're going to ask you to put in your questions into the box, and I'm going to keep reminding you because we're conscious that people, it's the end of the day, people are going to be coming and going, so we're reminded to do this and where you're actually, who you would wish to answer the question first. So to get on with things, we're going to start off with talking to John Brennan. Um, John is a GP. He's a practicing, uh, practicing general practitioner with a, he says, an interest in healthcare quality and patient safety, but in fact, it's more than interest because he's an, um, a fellow of the International Society of Quality in Healthcare. He works with ourselves and RCPI in designing and delivering quality improvement. He's been in the lead QI faculty for the National COPD and um, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. Um, um, improving collaborative. He's on the diploma in leadership and quality in community care. He's a chair of the Irish College of the General Practitioners of General Practice. He's published extensively. He's written books. He's literally written a book on quality improvement. And from my point of view, he's also been one of the best SHOs I've ever worked with. And it was a pleasure. And I think anyone who has him as a GP is a lucky person. So over to you, John. Thanks very much. I'm looking forward to what you're going to say. Gosh, Mary, I'd, I'd better be able to follow follow that introduction up now. <laughs> you're, 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 you're very kind, uh, and I'm not sure how much of that uh, I, I believe. I, I wouldn't necessarily regard myself as being much of an expert in anything, rather an advocate for uh, an approach and a way of thinking about kind of health and care. So um, first of all, for our audience this evening, um, well done and, and thank you for coming because uh, I think the value that you all can bring uh, in looking after whatever chronic conditions uh, you're looking after uh, in, in self-care uh, is really the, the greatest uh, untapped resource uh, that we have 
uh, in health and healthcare uh, in Ireland. Um, as Mary said, I'm a practicing GP most of the time. Uh, I do that uh, three days a week um, and uh, I, really, I really enjoy it. I think it's the greatest work in the world. Uh, and I very much see my role as, as being one that facilitates um, a co-production of, of health uh, where a professional uh, and a patient uh, or a patient and their family or a patient and their carers uh, come together uh, to work together uh, to produce uh, health, not just the, the absence of illness or infirmity, but um, a physical, a psychological and a social uh, well-being. Uh, and, and I suppose what's essential to that idea uh, is that both parties are, are coming together uh, to realize and, and produce a service. Health is not a product. Health care is, is, is not a product that can be handed from one person to another or, or outsourced. Uh, health care is a service that needs to be realized uh, through working together. Uh, and that involves you know, mutual respect from both parties uh, and interest uh, in, in what really matters. Um, so in talking about uh, kind of chronic disease in general practice, you know, GPs have been looking after chronic disease uh, forever uh, in, in some way or, or another. But up until quite recently, maybe it's been a little bit more ad hoc uh, and a little bit more reactive. Um, than it might otherwise have been. Uh, and just in the last couple of years, uh, thankfully, there have been some new developments, um, particularly uh, the introduction of a structured chronic disease management program um, in, in general practice. Um, that's HSE funded, uh, so it's free for people who currently have a medical card or, or a doctor visit card. Um, it's uh, structured, it's proactive, um, it's holistic, uh, and it's done, hopefully, with the clinician uh, that knows you and your family uh, and your context best uh, through building a relationship over long periods of time in looking after, uh, you know, anything and everything that needs to be looked after from before birth, uh, like Mary does in the hospital, uh, right up to the point of death. And um, in that program, um, it's targeted at, uh, I suppose, the most common chronic diseases that we see in Ireland today. Uh, so when it comes to illness of the heart, that's, um, you know, angina, heart attacks uh, and, and stents, anyone who's had any of those problems. Um, it, it, it's for people with an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation and for people with heart failure. Um, when it comes to the lungs, it's for people with asthma or people with chronic, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that's emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Uh, it's for people with diabetes, uh, and it's for people who've either had a stroke uh, or a mini stroke. And the aim of the program, uh, as we said before, is to realize better health, um, to try and optimize treatment for those conditions where they're, or where they're active and to bring them under control to restore and maximize function. Um, I think there's a, a sound coming through there of typing. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that's coming from, but um, but hopefully everyone can still hear me. And um, to 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 realise and restore function, uh, and then uh, in terms of secondary, what we call secondary prevention, trying to prevent those uh, conditions from ever causing you a problem uh, again. And um, so the way the program works uh, is that there's four visits per year to your GP. Um, two of those visits are generally with the practice nurse. You'll come in, you'll see the nurse. Uh, she'll check some some measurements. Um, on you, so your height, your weight, your waist circumference, your blood pressure and your heart rate. Um, she'll ask you and check your vaccination status for, for kind of key vaccines for people with chronic, chronic illness. Um, she'll ask you about uh, particular lifestyle factors, smoking, alcohol and exercise. Uh, she'll check what tests need to be done and, and, and do those. So they might include blood tests, a, a tracing of your heart or an ECG, uh, and maybe even a blood pressure monitor, which we can do in general practice uh, too. Um, she'll ask you about other parts of the health service you may be accessing or using, specialists that you might be seeing, clinics you're attending, other, other allied health professionals uh, who are involved. Um, she'll check 
uh, whether uh, you know the medication list we have for you is up to date or not. Uh, and she'll also very importantly start the care planning process with you. Uh, and that's the bit then that you'll, you'll pick up when you see your GP next time around. So roughly one to two weeks after that visit to the nurse and, and those tests have been taken and that initial kind of discussion and those initial checks have been done, then you'll be invited back to see your GP. And with your GP, then you'll be reviewing the results often of those investigations where we get a lot of ve very valuable information about, um, you know, the, the, objective, the objective kind of um, numbers that sometimes tell us whether an illness is under control or not. Um, but more importantly, we get an opportunity to ask you how, how you're feeling uh, and, and, what's go and what's going on, what's up, what, what are the major concerns when it comes to a, uh, your chronic illness, your experience of illness, uh, and, and what are the things that we can do uh, to help improve things in, in that sense. That's all kind of structured around a care plan, and, and a care plan is a, a shared document, a shared agreement uh, on what you'll work together with your GP on to try and, to try and maximize uh, your health. That's built around a key question. Mm -hmm. What matters to you, uh, and 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 it's from there that that um, good care planning happens, and effective care planning when you when you team up with your healthcare professional to to try and work on the things that matter most to you. I think it's easily e most easily understood with a story. Um, so I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about a patient that attends us. Um, Kathy is her name. She's seventy two. Um, she's got five children, uh, one in Canada, one in Australia, and three in Ireland, and ten grandchildren. They're ranging, ranging in age from 10 years of age right the way down to, to 18 months. And, and she's been attending the practice for the last 30 years. Um, she lives alone now, sadly. Her, her husband died suddenly um, when she was in her 50s. And she would have regarded herself, other than a short period of depression uh, earlier in life, she would have regarded herself as being in very good health. Uh, up until her mid-60s. Uh, and in her mid-60s, uh, she suffered a mild heart attack. She was admitted to the hospital and had a stent, which solved that problem. But while she was there, she was diagnosed with high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, she left the hospital. She entered the hospital on no medications, and she left the hospital under the impression that she would be on at least five or six medicines uh, for the rest, of, the rest of her life. Um, so we enrolled, uh, Kathy. we invited her to enroll in our chronic disease management program two years ago uh, now, uh, and we've been seeing her on, on a six monthly basis since. And, and when she joined the program, uh, there were a few things that stood out in her initial review. Um, the first was her weight, and um, she was overweight, and, and she knew that. Um, you know, it was something she was aware of. But I suppose what she didn't realize was that her weight was high enough to, to be falling into the obese category. She was smoking 10 cigarettes uh, a day uh, and was quite inactive. She wasn't exercising as regularly as, as she might have been. Um, her blood tests hadn't been done in about two years. And when they were done, they showed that her diabetic control was, was not as good as we would have liked it to have been. And, and around that, the other questions revealed that she wasn't getting her uh, eye testing done, her retina screen the way it should be, and her feet weren't being checked as regularly as they, they should have been. And um, we also discovered that, you know, there were a couple of vaccinations uh, that she was due that she hadn't had uh, that would have been protecting her particularly against winter illnesses. And I know there's going to be an important piece to talk about on vaccination later and um, in, in, in the subsequent um, in the subsequent kind of care planning conversation then when we asked her what really mattered to her uh, she said the most important things in her life uh, were her grandchildren uh, and uh, her tidy towns committee <laughs> she said she said john that's what you need to keep me healthy for uh, and in the subsequent visits every six months we worked around uh, those kind of core pieces that mattered to her she also told us that she worried about her ankles being swollen. She told us that her knees were too sore to exercise and that she felt her energy levels were always low and that her mood was not so good. So iteratively through those visits and those checks, we adjusted her blood pressure medication and the ankle swelling uh, disappeared. We got her knee pain uh, under control. She was able to move about a bit more again. Her weight started to fall. Her diabetic control improved uh, and she even dropped one of her blood pressure uh, medications, which was great. Um, we managed to, to work on a couple of other bits around her general health uh, as well. We got her in to see a podiatrist. We organized the retina screening. We got her vaccines up to date. But I think our biggest success 
um, one which she didn't believe possible at the start was that we managed to get her off those cigarettes. Uh, and again, we offered all sorts of smoking cessation interventions and programs. Uh, but she said, no, I think I think I know how I'll do this. Uh, and her trick was to put a picture, a photograph of her grandchildren in her purse. So anytime she went to buy cigarettes, she had to file past that photograph to the money uh, to, to, to get them. Uh, that and I suppose discussions and accountability with us on that care setting were, were the difference for her. So she told us. So, so very brief, I hope that illustrates uh, what the chronic disease management program is all about. And even if you're not qualifying for a medical card or a doctor visit card, your GP has the expertise generally uh, to structure care for chronic disease like that for your needs. Three top tips from me to finish on how you uh, and your GP can work around your chronic disease. Tip number one is seek continuity. Try and see the same doctor. Practices are getting bigger and busier. It can be hard to get into the same doctor, but try and see the same doctor because the research tells us that the less doctors you see, uh, the longer you will live. Um, tip number two is make a list uh, and bring it in with you and tell your GP as soon as you arrive in, I have a list so that you can triage it together. Be clear yourself on what the most important thing on that list is for you, so that, that can be front and center uh, of, of, of what can be covered. And be patient, because sometimes your GP will ask, is it okay if we cover some of these another day? And that's to keep, keep care safe for you and to maintain the highest level of quality. And my third tip then, and final tip, is to know, check, and ask. Always know your medications, know what tests are due, and know what the referrals are for. And if you don't, check and ask uh, with your GP so you can be clear. The system, the healthcare system is incredibly busy and not as reliable as it should be. So as we said before, you are the greatest untapped resource in keeping healthcare quality levels high and keeping you yourself safe and well. That's all I have to say, Mary. I'm, I'm looking forward to the questions at the end. Thanks so much, John. That was absolutely brilliant. Everybody, that was Dr. John Brennan, a GP, who's given a tour de force of how the importance of individualization of goal setting. And I absolutely love the idea of the photograph in the wallet to prevent the lady from buying her cigarettes. It shows people do know themselves best and know how to be able to do it. For those of you who've just joined us, you're very welcome to this evening um, session on from the Royal College of Physicians talking about managing chronic conditions. Um, if you have any questions for any members of the panel, please feel free to put them in, type them into the box and please direct, give us an idea of who you're directing to them and then we'll have a bit of discussion afterwards and we're going to do that at the end. Our next speaker has probably one of the best titles ever. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Kathy Carl is going to talk about a patient's experience from the Living Well program at Beaumont Hospital that improved her quality of life life and ability to self-manage so this is going to be fantastic so Kathy's background is in teaching she holds a BA in early education and she's living with multiple chronic health conditions and result unfortunately had to give her teaching profession the living well program was a huge turning point for her and I love what she says the focus from what she couldn't do to what she could do so instead of that negative bias that positivity bias give her a sense of purpose and gained huge self-confidence her ability to self-manage she now delivers the chronic disease self-management program, building better caregivers and the, and, and the chronic pain self-management program. I don't see how she has so many spare time with all this, but she, in her spare time, she does manage to practice yoga, which I do myself, so I improve, and mindfulness, and is a trained children's creative mindfulness practitioner, which sounds fascinating. So, Kathy, can't wait to hear what you're going to be saying. everyone can hear me okay. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Well, hi everyone. I'm Cathy and really glad to be here and to be part of this symposium among such distinguished speakers. And it's really great to have an opportunity to have a voice and also to be a voice for people living with long-term chronic health conditions. So just a little bit about me. I suppose my journey with um, chronic health conditions, it didn't begin until my 30s. Um, that's unfortunately when it came knocking on my door. Up until then, I had led, um, you know, a, a regular, healthy, normal life. 
um, I had energy to work in a profession that I loved, was able to socialize and do all of the regular things that I suppose we don't have to think about when we have our health. Um, but unfortunately, that all slowly but surely started to change when I just felt something was out of sync in my body. I suddenly had this debilitating fatigue. Um, I started to develop problems with my legs and my hips. And um, so my mobility was impacted. So after a long period of back and forth to various doctors, consultants, um, and over quite a long period of time, I was gradually diagnosed with multiple conditions, including, and the list is quite long, so apologies, um, iron deficiency anemia, pernicious anemia, Hashimoto's, PCOS, migraine, microscopic colitis, Lyme, ME, fibromyalgia, and then I have neurological damage in my legs and hips, and more recently, unfortunately, long COVID. Um, so that's definitely enough of a list. I don't want, I don't want any more. And I always joke that I attend everything ology in the hospital. And I think at this stage, I'm so familiar with hospitals, I could probably give tours in the hospital. But I continued on in my profession as a teacher, but my job, it just became steadily more challenging. Um, working with children, I was picking up every infection, which was turning into a myalgia, which was sometimes worse than the infection itself. Um, and eventually my body um, made the decision for me um, and I had to give up um, my teaching job and that's something that I wouldn't have decided myself but my, my body finally decided that for me and this was soul destroying um, you know it's my vocation something that I loved doing and I was now in a place where I couldn't trust my body and just how unpredictable it was um, I think there's a bit of feedback. I hope everyone can still hear me okay. Um, everything slowed down and I suppose my world became smaller. Um, I felt trapped in a body that didn't match who I am um, as a person. Day-to-day um, -day tasks became more challenging. Um, spontaneity went out the window. I, I struggled hugely um, I really, I struggled hugely with, I suppose, the whole acceptance around this, the isolation um, and also the judgment that I put on myself. Um, walking became more challenging um, and I had so many crashes and flares, which made it difficult to plan ahead for things. Um, I suppose I felt like I'd turned into an unreliable person having to cancel um, last minute um, and again, this really didn't match who I am as a person. I self-sabotaged my accomplishments and the progress I was, I was making um, because I felt it was nothing compared to what I used to be able to do before I became unwell. Um, I felt I was in a lockdown, pre-lockdown, um, and I didn't want to accept. Can you hear me, Mary? So everybody, thank you so much for your patience. We just had a minor technical issue, but as we were saying, that little music in the background was the kind of thing that would have slowly and surely drive, driven people mad. And also we want to get back to Cathy now because the story of the patient's journey is one of the most important things and one of the things that often stick with us as clinicians and seeing that experience. So welcome back to Cathy. Thank you very much. For you. Oh no. I think that sound is back, unfortunately, or maybe it's not. Hopefully it's gone. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. It must have been me talking too much that was making that sound to come across. Um, so I'll just start kind of halfway through where I was. I've already introduced myself um, and I've just mentioned about my, my journey with chronic conditions um, and when they came knocking on my door. Um, so I suppose after a long period of time of going back and forth to doctors and consultants, um, over a period of time, I was then diagnosed with quite a few um, health conditions. So I was diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia, pernicious anemia, Hashimoto's, PCOS, migraine, microscopic colitis, Lyme, ME, fibromyalgia, 
um, and also neurological damage in my legs and hips, more recently long COVID. And so I definitely don't want any more to add to that list. Um, and I joke that I attend everything um, ology in the hospital and that I could actually have got so familiar with hospitals that I could actually give tours. But my job, I continued on working um, as a teacher, which I loved, but it steadily became more challenging. And working with children, I picked up every infection going, which would then turn into a myalgia. And eventually my body made the decision for me that unfortunately I had to, I had to give up teaching. Um, and this is something that I wouldn't have decided myself, but my body just had really um, had taken enough of a bashing, I suppose, and I had to. And this was just soul destroying for me because it really was a vocation and a job that I loved. Um, and I was now in a place where I didn't trust my body and just how unpredictable it was. Um, everything slowed down um, and my world suddenly became a lot smaller. I felt trapped in a body that didn't match who I am um, as a person. And day to day tasks became more challenging. Uh, spontaneity went out the window. I, I struggled hugely um, with acceptance around this. Um, I put a lot of judgment on myself. Uh, walking started to become a lot more challenging. Crashes and flares meant that it was difficult to plan ahead for things. Um, I felt that I turned into an unreliable person that had to cancel last minute, um, which really didn't match who I am as a person. Uh, I self-sabotaged my accomplishments um, and progress by telling myself this was nothing compared to what I used to be able to do before I was unwell. Um, and I felt I was in a lockdown um, before lockdowns. Um, and I didn't want to accept that this was my new reality. Uh, I had a lack of control and just so much uncertainty of who am I now? I mean, who is this person? Um, because it, it certainly wasn't the same person that I was before. And I suppose the majority of my conditions are invisible. And that made it a lot more difficult also, because if you'd have broken arm or broken leg, people can see it. And there's a timeline to recovery. Whereas with a lot of um, chronic health conditions, they're invisible. So people don't see it. And there's that, I suppose, a lack of understanding. And you might have a good day and somebody might see you in a coffee shop having a you know, cup of coffee and say, oh, you look fantastic. You know, are you better? Not realizing the amount of planning and pacing and effort it takes to do that. And then possibly you'd have a week afterwards where you may be in the bed. So that um, people want a good news story and you want to be able to give one saying, yes, I'm feeling better. But very often that's just not the reality. So that's where I was. And then thankfully the Living Well program um, I saw um, an advert for it, the HSE with CHO9, and I signed up to the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. Um, and it was just, it came along at the right time uh, for me. And it really was one of those light bulb moments. Um, I signed up to the seven week online program. And I was now, even though it wasn't in a, in a community setting like we are now, it was a virtual room, but it was with people who understood um, people who understood and they may have had different chronic health conditions to me, but the challenges and struggles were very, very similar. And there was such a comfort in knowing that I wasn't alone and that people understood the challenges without having to give lengthy explanations and one word and people just got it. Uh, my focus um, slowly shifted from that attitude of I can't do this anymore. I just can't do that to, you know, I can do things, maybe not in the same way that I did before, but I still can do an awful lot of things. And I was introduced, and I suppose the best way to really highlight this is with a slide. Um, so I was introduced to a self-management toolbox, which explored, um, we explored ways each week in to how to use these tools. You can see it on the slide there, which could break that symptom cycle at different points. So we can see that symptom cycle there with like physical limitations, pain, stress, difficult emotions, low mood and depression, shortness of breath, fatigue. So over the six weeks, you're introduced to all of those fantastic um, 12 tools in the toolbox. And the thing is to try, try things out for two weeks before deciding which tools work best for you. So if you look at, say, physical activity, and physical activity is different for people, um, depending on where you're at. So it's very much focused on where you're physically right at at the moment. So physical activity 
can break that cycle at lots of points. So at, at physical limitations, it can also help with pain. It can help with stress, with difficult emotions. Another tool using your mind where you look at techniques like distraction, helpful thinking, guided imagery, a body scan. That can help with shortness of breath. It can also help with fatigue. It can help with stress. It can help with poor sleep. Um, and we might just move on to the next slide there. So these are really the core skills that I learned in that seven week program. So the core skills in the self-management toolbox, and you would have seen them highlighted in red, and that's making decisions, action planning, and problem solving. Um, and they really help you use all of the other tools in the toolbox more effectively. So making decisions, making decisions can be very difficult when you're living with chronic conditions and you're in a time of uncertainty. So learning that process and that skills together um, of you know, the whole process of making a decision using the pros and cons technique and practicing it with other people, just it made me feel a lot more confident and comfortable going to that process when I did have decisions to make. Action planning was hugely important for me. It was setting a, an achievable and doable goal, something I could accomplish in the space of a week and I'd be feeding back to the other participants the following week. Um, again, that focused changed the focus for me on what I couldn't do to what I could do. Uh, before I had a goal in mind, I said, oh, I don't know where to get started. It's just too overwhelming. I'm not going to bother. Whereas with this, it's something that you want to do um, and you're breaking it down into very specific steps. And problem solving, again, was a really useful tool, which I found helpful for everything in life, whether related to my conditions or not. And again, getting familiar with going through this whole problem solving process. So again, at the end of those six weeks, you're armed with those tools that you can dip in and out of. Other techniques that we also covered were dealing with difficult emotions and emotions play a huge role in our whole well-being. Um, and I think for me, certainly with a lot of physical symptoms like pain, um, I kind of lost sight of that. So this was really, really helpful to look at the emotional side, which is, is hugely important. We looked at pain and fatigue management, exercise and physical activity. And I know as a participant, I was very nervous when I saw that exercise and physical activity thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to. But as I said, it's really catered, it was catered towards everybody and where they were and um, where they were right at that moment, you know, not where they wanted to be in six months time, where you are right now. Um, relaxation techniques, we were introduced to, as I said, um, guided imagery, body scan, helpful thinking, distraction, and it really highlighted to me the power that the mind has over the body. Um, we practice better breathing, which isn't just for people with asthma, you know, or COPD. It's also very helpful for stress and anxiety. Um, healthy eating and weight management. And again, we give, well, we were given all the information around healthy eating, but certainly not telling people, you know, what to eat, what not to eat, just really arming them with that information um, and learning how to read food labels and understand what is in the food that they're consuming. We also looked at communication skills. That was a turning point for me. It was how you communicate more effectively with your family and friends um, about your conditions, about your needs but also how you communicate with yourself. And I realized I wasn't being very kind to myself. Um, so really checking to see, you know, am I being a friend to myself, challenging those thoughts, um, which again was, was really, really helpful. We looked at dealing with low mood and depression and also making informed treatment decisions. So I was armed with all of these new um, and introduced to all of these new um, techniques and skills from the toolbox, which just have made such a huge difference to my life. Am I still living with all these debilitating, challenging conditions? Absolutely. But I'm now able to self-manage. I'm now taking control back. I, you know, I was in a terrible space where I was just not able to make decisions, not knowing what was ahead. Now I'm, I'm a lot more confident at self-managing and that is 100% down to the Living Well program. I might just go on to the next slide. So what is it? Well, it's a scripted evidence-based program and it's licensed through the Self-Management Resource Center in California. Um, and online, it is offered to a group of generally 10 to 12 participants, two trained leaders, and this is really the crux of it. One of the leaders has to be living with a long-term health condition. So you're not having people talking at you that don't understand the challenges. So this really made it so relatable. It's on for two and a half hours 
um, a week over a six week um, period and there's just a session zero as well so it's really over seven weeks but two and a half um, hours a week and you know that can be scary for some people that um that might think I can't sit for that period of time. You absolutely don't have to. There's stretch breaks, there's breaks. We, you know, some participants join from their bed, some lying from on the ground. I mean, that's another bonus of it being online is you can really look after your comfort and your needs. I might just go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is just really, um, this is just really a timeline to give you an idea. I'll just briefly go through this because I'm conscious of our time. Um, so in 1978, Dr. Kate Larig arrived at Stanford University. So originally this program was specifically for people living with arthritis. Um, so in 1979, the arthritis self-management program was completed and the first 14 leaders trained. In 1993, the chronic disease self-management program was developed and research was completed um, in 1996. Um, in 1994, in response to um, the HIV and AIDS crisis, the CDSMP was adapted um, for use in people who were HIV positive. Then Dr. Sandra LaFord in St. John's Newfoundland adapted to the ASMP for use of people with chronic pain, another fantastic program, the Chronic Pain Self-Management Program. Then you can see there, there's also a program for people living with diabetes, um, one for carers, which is building better caregivers, and also cancer thriving and surviving. Um, in 2017, the Self-Management Resource Center was created and the Workplace Chronic Disease Self-Management Program was developed. Obviously, COVID came along. These programs were all delivered in the community. COVID came along and a lot of work went on behind the scenes to make to pivot the program on online, which has had a lot of positives to it. We might just go on to the next slide, please. So there we can see it again, the timeline for Ireland. So as I said, in 78, um, the programme was developed. In 2005, um, it came to Ireland and was delivered in different parts of the country. National Lottery came on board um, along with Sloan to Care um, and Your Voice Matters in 2019, which was fantastic because it, you know, it was funding for the programme. So the funding would be able to be delivered to people for free and reach a lot more people. Um, Dr. David Heavey came on board with, from Trinity College and did research around this programme. Um, and the positive um, results of the research are, are really they're fantastic to see. And one of the things interesting was the attendance was far greater online than in the community. And that makes sense because people living with lots of, you know, multiple chronic conditions may find it difficult to travel or to sit for a period of time. Whereas it being online, as you can see there in 2020, when it went online, people could really look after their, their comforts from their own home. I might just move on. So these are the programs um, that are run by CHO9, um, the HSC, as I say, they're free programs. So you can see there what's on offer. So there's the Living Well with Chronic Health Conditions, the Living Well with Chronic Pain, also the Living Well for Building uh, Better Caregivers for Carers, Cancer Thriving and Surviving, the Workplace Living Well with Chronic Health Conditions. And then is also there's a group for um, specifically for people living with long COVID, also with kidney disease, and then the MS group. And that has been very positive. Again, having that space for people that are living with the one condition that have that common humanity for each other, that common understanding that it's a safe space where people can share and, you know, um, and really bond with each other. And that's something as well. It's, it's um, I obviously went on to, I, I got so much from the program. I went on and trained to become a facilitator in, in these programs. And that's one thing you'd really see um, even online the people really bond and that connection and they go on to stay in touch long after the six weeks. Um, and they also get this, I'm just holding up to the screen, hope you can see, they get this fantastic book, which is a living a healthy life with chronic conditions. I call it my chronic disease Bible. So much information in it. Um, it's a fifth edition that's down to feedback from participants looking at science, making the changes. So after the six weeks, people have this book forever, a bit like that toolbox they can continuously dip in and out of. I'll just go to my final slide. So who can attend? Um, anybody with a long-term health condition, anybody caring for somebody also, um, if you're not living with a condition, if you're caring for someone with a long-term health condition. Um, the Building Better Caregivers is for those caring for a child, teenager, young adult, parent, family member, uh, loved one or friend. You must be over 18. It's not suitable for anybody with a significant intellectual impairment or with advanced dementia. Um, 
it's also um, healthcare professional referrals or also a self-referral. So the contact, if this is something that you think you would benefit from, as I have hugely benefited from, uh, the contact information is on the screen there uh, to register for a program or inquire. So Leah Harrington is the coordinator for CHO9 um, and it doesn't matter where you are in the country, you can still access it um, because it's, it's online so it's accessible to you and her email address is there at leah.harrington at hse.ie and her contact number is there. So thank you so much everybody um, and thanks, thanks for your time. Wow, Cathy, that was, I'm so glad we sorted everything out because that was amazing. I think living well better be ready for the amount of people who are going to log on to, tomorrow. And I'm thinking actually, this is the kind of program that people could do for life. You know, this is giving you a skill set of self management that is incredible. Thank you so much. That was amazing. So, for those of you who just joined us, we are, you're very welcome to the RCPI this evening. We've listened to Dr. John Brennan, who's a GP. Kathy has given, Kathy Carroll has given, amazing advertisement for living well and the next person we're going to listen to is Prof Liam Plant who's president of the Irish Nephrology Society. So Liam um, graduated in physiology and nephrology society, physiology and medicine um, so he's a smart man he's working as a nephrologist and that means a kidney specialist and for those of you who are in medics nephrology are the intelligentsia in medicine they're the people that explain things to us that most of us don't really understand like electrolyte disturbances he's lots of interests including transplantation home dialysis kidney injury and um, disorders of fluid, fluids and electrolytes renal disease and pregnancy my colleagues in cork in pregnancy say that he's an absolute gentleman to work with um, he's been working, um, he's on the board of Marymount uh, University Hospital and Hospice. He's the current president of the Irish Nephrology Society and recently was appointed vice dean for clinical and strategic partnerships in the College of Medicine and Health UCC. So UCC are you lucky to have him. So interested, can't wait to hear what you're going to say today, Liam. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Mary, and hi all. Thanks very much for the opportunity to participate uh, in, this, uh, in this session here today. I was listening very carefully to the introduction you gave there, Mary, and it just reminds me that in my everyday work dealing with people with uh, chronic kidney disease, those that I know best would say, gosh, you're a very smart fella. How come you can't help me get rid of the cramps in my legs at night time? How come you can't help me get rid of the itch that I have, etc." I have been really impressed by the first two presentations, and I was delighted with what Cathy uh, shared about her experience with um, with the Living Well program because many of the patients with whom I work have also participated in that as part of the Irish Kidney Association, our sister organizations fund, and it really is a wonderful program. What I'm trying to do here, just to share a few thoughts with you, is to move the focus a little bit away from the individual patient, not because I think we should move it away from the individual patient, we should keep it in the individual patient. But sometimes people think that focusing on self-care and self-empowerment is about focusing on an added benefit service, which will be of interest to a limited number of patients, but which might not really be important for everybody and anybody. And I don't agree with this at all. And that's why I want to share these thoughts with you. Next slide, please. So I just want to say a few things about chronic kidney disease. And I'm really just using chronic kidney disease as an example of a chronic condition. There are lots of other chronic conditions, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart failure, etc. So the, I'm speaking about chronic kidney disease because I know most about it. But I'd really like you just to take this as what do we think about all of these kinds of conditions? And one of the things we should think about is how common are they? Um, you know, this isn't something that happens to other people far away. And what are the consequences to people? Next slide, please. So these are some of the kind of images that people get when they're looking at booklets or videos about different kinds of chronic disease. So with kidney disease, we, of course, have dialysis which is a condition which is necessary in about 600,000 people in the world are on dialysis. Um, and that's the kind of extreme end of the kidney disease. But if you look up at the upper part of this slide, you'll see a series of circles or, or ellipses, I suppose, 
or anyway, they're not circles, they're like circles, whatever the word for the shape they are is. And if you notice, you'll see that they progressively move from right, uh, from left to right. And this is the whole central issue of chronic diseases. We start off as possibly being people at risk of getting them. There may be circumstances in which we can stop ourselves getting them. We get them in their early stages. And we may start to have some consequences or some complications. And then they move on to more complicated stages, more complicated stages in the end. And the further we move to the right, the more medicalized we become, the more contact we have with healthcare workers, technology, etc. But at every stage in our journey, we have some complications that we may need to deal with. If you see that little square grid down there, you can see up on the top left hand corner, the boxes are green and down on the bottom right, they're red. And I'm not going to go into what the details of these are, but as we move through the stages of chronic illness, the burdens on us become more and more. And if you take, uh, if you ask the question, well, you know, how does society help people with chronic kidney disease? Well, I know many people for very many years with kidney disease. I meet them for perhaps 20 minutes, four times a year. Hopefully some of that interaction is valuable, but most of the time they're on their own. They'll go and see other health workers. Most of the, of the time they're on their own. And how can they best live well with that? Next slide, please. This is just to point out to you, this is kidney disease. This may surprise some of you. This is a very important study which was published in 2017. And I just want to share with you how many people have this one chronic kidney disease, let alone any of the others. Next, please. So there are, were almost 1.2 million deaths in the world in 2017 due to kidney disease. And the percentage of people uh, afflicted by it have gone up by 40% over a short period of time. Next, please. There are almost 700 million people in the world with chronic kidney disease, one chronic health condition. Next slide, please. As well as those who passed away from this condition, there were an additional 1.4 million people who died as a consequence of it. Next, please. And perhaps in a different way, we're not talking about people who died, we're talking about people whose quality of life was affected. There were over 36 million disability life years lost. So let me just summarize this. This is one chronic kidney disease. One in 25 of the world's population die from it. Over 700 million people in the world have it. Over 36 million years of valuable life are disturbed by it. So this is, if you like, looking at the wood. But within that wood, there's a whole series of individual trees, of individuals who suffer this. And as the World Health Organization often points out, there are not enough healthcare workers to deal even with the medical uh, or the nursing or the physiotherapy aspects of that. For people to be able to deal with this, they need something else. And I think that something else is what's the tone of these meeting. Next slide, please. And just in case you think that Ireland is somehow different from this, could you just open up that slide, Gilmy? Just bring the whole things down. Next slide. Stop now. Yeah, yeah, okay. So broadly speaking, what's the situation in Ireland? In Ireland with kidney disease, you can see there's some data there from a study in Southwest Ireland. Effectively, one in 10 of the population has stage three or more chronic kidney disease and about one in three of the population uh, aged uh, in the older age groups have it. So lots of our fellow citizens have these conditions, have this condition as well as others. Next slide, please. You can pass through that and come on to the next one because that was really just to, to show it other way. So show this box, please. So if you look on the right hand side, this is a condition which affects 10% of the population of Ireland as it does of the world. Now, if you look in the, in the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see that about half the people have the earliest stage of it. The next proportion of it have what we call stage three, which is the next stage up. But down at the bottom, dialysis and transplantation, which is the group of patients that I mainly work with, 
There's very, very few of those. So we pour lots of resources into those patients of a technical and pharmaceutical and organizational and medical level. But most of the people with this condition are at an earlier stage. And all of those, to some extent, will have some disruption to their lives, etc. Next slide, please. So there's a whole myriad of consequences of this particular chronic kidney disease. Can you just populate the slide on the left, please? Next one. So here we've got a very common condition. Many of the, more than half the people who have this condition don't know they have it. What can we do about it? Next slide, please. So this is the second part of the theme. And the, the question is, what can we do about it as individual? Just held from Kathy, what individual patients can do for themselves about it. And that's really important. We've heard what GP priorities for dealing with this are. I would say myself in our clinical outpatients, we try to do it. But what do we think about what do we do for this as citizens and as policymakers? Next slide, please. So every year, uh, you know, there's World Kidney Day, the same as there's World Cancer Day, then there's World Tuberculosis Day, there's World Every Kind of Day, uh, which is important to highlight things. And all these kinds of good messages are put out and we try to share them with people. You know, take a good fluid intake, have your blood pressure checked, look after women and children, look after your healthy diet, treat diabetes. And all of these are the kinds of things that we think will stop people getting uh, getting uh, kidney disease or it getting worse. Next slide, please. And we have all sorts of very profound, did you see the little boxes down there? All the, the things that we can do to decrease the severity of kidney disease. Next slide, please. And all the way we look through from childhood to infancy to, to adolescence to adult life to old age, what people can do. And if you can see that slide properly, and I don't want you to read it all, I just want you to see there's all these kinds of things like avoid, manage, treat, etc. So a box like this looks very good, and this contains within it the recipe as to how we should stop that. But show us the next slide, please. But this is what the problem is. Next. Okay, I can't control the slides here from that kind of view. So if you take a look down the right hand side here, uh, so if you take a look down the left hand side, you'll see some kinds of things which are good to keep yourself well if you have this condition. Get yourself diagnosed, have your blood pressure checked, control your weight, take medications to help things. But if you look on the right-hand side, you'll find that most of the studies which look at how good are we as societies at achieving these, um, we're sending these messages as top-down messages. Get your Screen yourself for kidney disease. Most people with kidney disease aren't screened at all. Um, you know, make sure you stop smoking if you've got a condition. Many people find it difficult to do that. Have your blood pressure checked. You've got figures down there of how difficult it is to actually achieve that. So we have a kind of a top-down message that this is what we should do, but this is not permeating its way into the, to the everyday lives of the people who these affect. Next slide, please. So this is why I think, like the others in this volume, that self-care and self-empowerment is more than just a special added bonus type bespoke healthcare practice for individuals. Of course it is that, but it is something without which I don't think we can achieve the public health goals we have in the world, the communitarian values that we have about you know looking after others in our society if we don't help people develop self-care strategies and self-empowerment strategies. And there's just two questions to this which I'm going to round down with. One of them is what do they look like? And you've heard a little bit what they look like. And obviously for many people it makes people feel better. It gives them a sense of control. But do they actually also change the outcomes for people? Next slide, please. 
So these are the kinds of things that are current in reflecting on how to help people, uh, particularly with kidney disease. Up there on the left-hand side, living well with kidney disease um, by patient and care partner empowerment, kidney health for everyone everywhere. This is what underpins the International World Kidney Day uh, scenario. And there is a belief that not only is it important and respectful to the autonomy of individuals that they should be empowered uh, and informed, but also that it would be better for them. And we also need to look at the interaction between how people behave and how people understand. Next slide, please. So just there on the left hand side, you can see this is a big public health issue for the World Health Organization. 2022 revision, all sorts of issues on the importance of self-care interventions and the repeat mantra that I've already stated here, that there are not enough healthcare workers to deal with the things that you need a healthcare worker for, and that we really need to empower and release the potential that lies within people to uh, deal with things. You can see there the blue and the green overlapping with each other, the health setting and the everyday life setting. And for many of the things that you go to a hospital outpatients for, you know, for management, measurement, treatment, many of those, if you put self in front of them, well, then you may well be able to do it better, understand it better. We work with some patients who do their hemodialysis entirely in their own home. They attach themselves to their machines. They monitor themselves. They treat themselves. And we know that those individuals have a better quality of life than others. That's an extreme example of it. But what we really need to know is what's the right mixture about what people do themselves and what they do in the healthcare environment. Next, please. And these are the concepts that we need to be ensuring that people have in order to be able to help themselves and help society by being good at it. We need to help people to develop resilience in the face of their uh, illnesses. They need to be able to make the social connections that will help them. They need to have awareness and they need to have knowledge. The, the two are slightly different. They need to be access support. Uh, they need confidence and control. And we need to be focusing on patient-centered wellness. All too often in the past, we've looked at you know, what's the treatment of this? And somebody says, oh, this tablet is the treatment for that. There's something we're very pleased about in the international kidney community. It's called the SONG Initiative, um, Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology, which it's looked at by a partnership between patients and healthcare workers. What are the outcomes that we would consider to be important as goals for treatment? And it's quite interesting because for healthcare workers, survival and biochemical methods are, are often viewed as the most important. Now, they're also viewed as important by patients. But for patients, controlling their symptoms and minimizing the impact on their life uh, is more important. Now, that's also important to the healthcare workers, but there is a discrepancy between them. And we've probably used the phrase quality of life a little bit too much and maybe not enough of life participation, how health the uh, how health problems interfere with that. Next slide, please. And this is the kind of thing, this is a restatement of much of what we've heard before, that if you want to live well with kidney disease or with any disease, well, you can see that there are clinical strategies, which are kind of traditionally the domain of healthcare providers and policy setters. Um, you've got strength-based approaches. Now, this is a shared thing, trying to help people understand and be well. And on the left-hand side, often neglected in the supports we give to individuals are how can they manage their symptoms and how can they minimize the impact on their lives? Next slide, please. And here we have, you'll be pleased to see, living well, which exactly fits into the space that the international kidney community wants. Next slide. The last thing I just want to share with you is the notion that what about knowledge and what about behavior? It would seem as a given that if people's health literacy is higher, in other words, if they understand their illness better, 
then they will be empowered to behave better and do better like that. And there's an example of some of the platforms that you can use to enhance uh, knowledge and, and, to, and to upskill people and empower them with knowledge about their conditions. But, show me the next slide. Will it make it better? This is a typical dreadful medical kind of slide. But what this is, is this is looking at do people whose knowledge of their illness behave better or is lower behave better or behave worse? So you've got a, a, you've got a few types of things scattered through that particular slide there. And effectively speaking, just the line that runs down the middle of it is the line that uh, that is uh, the, 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 the level for somebody with a, with a higher level of health knowledge. So on the left hand side, lower medical adherence. You might think that people whose knowledge and health literacy is higher would be better at complying with their medications, but that's not the case. The dot is below the line. You might think that people who know less might smoke more, and that is the case. They might have lower activities, that is the case. But I mean, with all the education we have, if you look at sugary uh, beverages and fast food consumption, it would appear that that is lower in people with lower health literacy than higher health literacy. I share this paradox just to illustrate to you that it's difficult. It's not just a situation who will tell people about their condition and that will change their behavior. Next slide, please. This is a slide, and I, can you just put, push the next one here? This is a very busy kind of a slide, but I want to, I'll just say to you what this slide shows. This looks at people who are a judge. This is a big study from Taiwan about kidney disease. What they're trying to see here is if you have, a, if you exhibit a higher level of healthcare knowledge and a, and a higher adherence to behaviors that we consider to be good, will your kidney function get worse less quickly? I'll say that again. They, you would imagine or you would hope that if you could make people understand better and you could help them to have behavior patterns which are more helpful, that their kidney function will not get worse uh, as much as it is. And what this particular slide demonstrates is that does seem to be the case. Now, whether it's that those that are better informed and are able to adhere to better behaviors are doing better than the others or that the other ones are doing worse is not the case. But this is an example, not that you just this is good stuff to make people feel better. This is good stuff which makes people's illness change its behavior. This is knowledge and behavior behaving like a medication. And it's hard to show that. Next slide, please. You can go through the, you can go through the circles. It was just showing the same things three times. Um, and this is another one which shows the same thing. Push the button again. Broadly speaking, push the, push the next uh, thing up there. Broadly speaking, what this particular slide shows is that if you take people whose adherence to practices which are felt to be healthy are excellent, fair or poor, what you will consistently view is that those whose behaviours are adjudged to be poor will tend to do worse. And very interestingly, most of the things that they looked at in this particular slide uh, were to do with adherence to Medicaid. This is actually to do with largely with smoking and with weight, etc. So this is again, this doesn't necessarily mean that empowerment and improved self-care is better for you, but it certainly shows that lack of empowerment and lack of self-care is worse for you. This is like not being on a medication. Next slide. So those are just the kind of thoughts and things that I would take away with you. If I look at the experience I've had in my professional life with chronic kidney disease, which is a classic chronic condition, it, I would agree that it, is, it seems to be obvious and a really good approach that we should be helping people uh, to be empowered and help to have self-care. But there's lots of domains to those and we're possibly not very good at doing uh, some of them. 
One of the problems in the traditional medical model is it's difficult to measure how successful people are with this. But I think that there are some signals that behavior is certainly altered beneficially, and that people feel better, and there's also a few signals that outcomes are improved. Last push. Last. Oh, it's gone. The last message there was that I think we need to be getting better at embedding self-care and self-empowerment into what we do all the time for the benefit of people with chronic disease. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Liam. That was uh, not just empowering, but also powerful, respectful and practical. Um, very much appreciated today. That was absolutely brilliant. And I love the new phrase I've learned of life participation. It's much nicer than talking about quality of life, because then we start going into economic analysis. It always feels very statistical. Um, next on our presentation, so again, welcome to everyone who's joined us. We've had a talk from John Brennan, a GP, Kathy Carroll, a patient, the implant president of the Irish Nephrology Society. The next person is one of our favourite people in any community, is the community pharmacist. You know, Hagen is owner and managing director of the Mars Pharmacy Group. She's going to talk about information about how community pharmacists can help self-care and provide support to those with chronic health conditions. Una has got an incredibly impressive biography as does everybody here today so she's director um, of the mara's pharmacy group and um, they have an online store which is 58 countries all over the world she's held positions at the pharmaceutical society of ireland she's on the strategic board of the school of pharmacy in trinity and she's driven entrepreneur and listen to this she said been the delight best managed one of the delights best managed company in ireland for eight consecutive years she's been recognized as one of ireland's great places to work Want to kind of work for you myself, Una, and has reached the top 30 places to work in Ireland for 2021, which I imagine was an interesting year to be a community pharmacist. So over to you, Una. Can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, I'm just trying to pull up my slides here. Um, I hope you can see it. I might have to get Gilly to give me a hand. Oh, thank you, Gilly. Um, Here we go, <laughs> technophobe. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Mary, for the introduction. And thank you very much as well to everybody for joining this evening. Um, as Mary said, my name is Uno O'Hagan. I'm um, the owner and managing director of the Marriage Pharmacy Group. And I'm also a qualified pharmacist for um, 30 odd years now at this stage. And I wanted to talk to you really this evening a, a little bit about what community pharmacists um, can do and do do day to day um, that you may not be aware of in terms of um, managing chronic illnesses. And I think if anything that I've learned through the pandemic um, was just how much that we can step up and support our GP colleagues and those working in secondary care to have a much more multidisciplinary approach um, where we keep patients at the centre of care. And whilst the pandemic was an awful time for so many people, particularly people with chronic illnesses, a lot of innovation and really great uh, collaboration came out of it. And for me as a community pharmacist and the owner of the Marsh Pharmacy Group, we certainly want that to continue. Um, we want to make sure that the patient always stays at the centre of care. So Gilly, I might get you just to move it on. And um, that's just a picture of me, not that you need that. So <laughs> we'll move that on, Gilly. So um, just to talk a little bit about community pharmacy in general. And I'm sure everybody on this call will know their community pharmacists really well. Um, so we, there's 1,900 um, and five pharmacies in Ireland today. And community pharmacists are in every town, city and village all across Ireland. We actually see 78 million visits uh, to community pharmacy every single year. That's 19 visits per person, per man, woman and child every single year. So we are frequently visited um every single day and i would say we know our patients intimately um we know not only about their chronic illness we know about their children their grandchildren the name of their dogs and their cats 
we get to hear absolutely everything about them. And from that, that gives us a great insight into not only the patient and their illness, but actually how they're living with it um, at home as well. So 50% of the Irish population actually live within one kilometre of their community pharmacy and 85% of the population live within a five kilometre distance. So really we're very accessible as healthcare professionals and everybody on the call would know that advice in a community pharmacy here in Ireland is free of charge, completely free. No appointment is really necessary unless you're booking in for a service and we're open very long hours and at weekends and bank holidays as well. So really we have a highly qualified professional working within the community that you can pop in to see every single day if you want to. And I'm very privileged to say that in Mars Pharmacy, many of our patients do come to see us every single day because we see sometimes patients who don't have anybody else in living in Dublin maybe or living even in the world that they that any other family and so there's a whole loneliness thing as well that goes on and sometimes the community pharmacy is a place as a social place to come to and we love to see those patients coming in because it's really about building a trusted relationship with your community pharmacy so Gilly I might just get you to move it to the next slide please so I suppose if I take it back just to our business in Mars, what we really um, like to talk about is a holistic approach. And I'm delighted to hear this evening from the previous speakers talking really about self-care and self-empowerment. And that's what we really champion in our business is that proactive, that preventative approach. That's what we mean by holistic, that we look at the overall picture. We look at the patient's sleep, their exercise, their diet. So we're not only giving advice on medications day to day, but we're actually looking at how the patient is actually living with their illness. There's so many different illnesses that we can and do every single day in community pharmacy really um, interact with and try to, to really focus on, but in particular in, in our own pharmacy group, we really try and do a lot with cardiovascular patients with diabetic patients and also with people who have um, obesity as well because these are genuine huge health concerns that really need to be addressed not only for the patient but actually for overall population as well. So we talked, I've heard a lot about health promotion and about awareness um, in the community and there's many 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 different health promotion campaigns that are run by the HSE every single year and of course we champion all of those and get involved in all of those but we also really look at the type of patients that we have and that they they actually differ pharmacy to pharmacy i have nine pharmacies in dublin but depending on where that pharmacy is there's different um conditions that are prevalent in those conditions in those areas sorry so we try to make it a very focused um health campaign that we might be running in the particular communities that we actually serve in because we know what type of patients that come in day to day. And we also work with our local GPs and also other healthcare providers within that area, community groups, and it could be Age Action, it could be you know, a number of different groups to actually run campaigns and promotions and health awareness events to actually serve the local community, if that makes sense. So we always champion what else can we do for the local community and what else can we do for, for our um, patients day to day. So Gillian might move that on. Now, we talked, a lot, a lot of the speakers talked about empowerment um, and talked about education and awareness. It's my experience after 30 years working in this field that when patients understand what is actually happening um, and can piece together the little pointers you're going to have a better healthcare outcome. So I often say to my team, we are actually a team of educators. We're like teachers, really. We're using our knowledge and our skills to bring that to the fore to patients. Because if I take just one example of this, and it's the work that we do around menopause, and we're in Menopause Awareness Month, patients very often don't understand what's happening in their own bodies. But once you can break that down and explain the why they're experiencing the symptoms, light bulbs start to go off. And then they start to realize, you know, all the different symptoms that are actually connected. And from that, when they understand the why, then they'll take action. And that's really the essence of what we do. We really believe in education. We really believe in awareness. And we really believe in sharing the knowledge that we have. Because when we do that, the patient has an informed 
choice. And that is about em empowerment, really, and turning the dial, as a previous speaker said, away from sickness and much more towards health, because we're trying to embrace a more proactive approach. Now, we deal with three different um, cohorts of patients, if you want to uh, categorize patients into that. Those with chronic illnesses and are living with chronic illnesses day to day, those who have a high risk of developing chronic illnesses, and that might be they're just predisposed to um, a particular illness or their lifestyle may make them um, more prone to that illness. And then we have the general population. And we take a very different bespoke approach to each one of those. Obviously, those with chronic illnesses, we're doing a lot more activity. We run a lot more events and a lot more screening for them to help them manage their chronic illness. But also, we're trying to catch people before they develop a chronic illness, because we know these patients, we know their medicines that they're on before they, they, they venture maybe into diabetes. So even pre-diabetic patients, we're trying to do a lot more education to, to, to really slow down or prevent them actually becoming uh, having a chronic illness and then we have obviously the general population that we run campaigns for as well so i might move it on gilly because i just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do so if i just take a few examples um in terms of cardiovascular um obviously blood pressure checking and 24-hour blood pressure monitoring is really really important because as, as previous speaker said here today you know, cardiovascular disease is often very silent and people don't realize that they have high blood pressure or high cholesterol even for that sake without um, getting screened. So we do a lot of screening where we would give the patient the results sent to take to their GP or we will work hand in hand with our local GPs or actually secondary care in some locations to actually run campaigns such as that. Also in terms of diabetes, um, we do a lot of HbA1c screening which I'll talk about in a little second, and NAFLD screening. So this is non-alcohol uh, fatty liver disease that is a silent epidemic in type 2 diabetic patients. But of course, patients don't know about that either. We do a lot of vaccines. Again, it's all about prevention. So in terms of flu, COVID, shingles, pneumococcal, and, and many more, and a lot of point of care testing. Point of care testing in our consultation rooms, but actually during COVID, when we couldn't have patients really in our consultation rooms, we really migrated this online and teamed up with Let's Get Checked in order to do the point of care testing and for them to actually have a call with a healthcare professional. So really, and all what we, what we really champion in Mars is that collaboration between our GP colleagues, between hospital teams, and between other now digital services, which I'll talk about in a little second, to really, really make sure that people know what their numbers are um, and so that they can take action, that their GP can then intervene with appropriate care. And this is just one example, um, which we ran with Professor Suzanne Norris. Um, Professor Norris is a, a gastroenterologist and a hepatologist up in uh, St. James's Hospital. She also set up the liver wellness unit there. And we were the first pharmacy to ever team up with secondary care like this to run liver screening. So we welcomed Suzanne and her team into our pharmacies and she screened our type 2 diabetic patients for this condition, which would normally take a referral from a GP up to six month referral waiting time to bring them into a hospital setting in order to get scanned. Well, we brought that scanning outside of this, the hospital setting and we did it in our community pharmacies. And what we were looking for was NAFLD, so a liver stiffness score. And we screened, the last time we did the screening, we had screened 200 patients, 85% of them actually were type 2 diabetic and we were looking for people who were drinking less than 10 alcohol units per week and the results are absolutely shocking like one in five people actually had a normal score that's four in five had an normal score so really high scores we even had six near almost seven percent of those patients actually had cirrhosis so this is trying to really intervene when it's a silent epidemic that's going on in type 2 diabetic patients and also anybody who's carrying excess weight as well, trying to get them to actually know what their numbers are. So then, depending on what the results are, to get pointed into the right, most appropriate centre of care, which is obviously into the liver wellness unit in this instance. The second um, collaboration that we did recently was actually with the Matter Hospital with the diabetic clinic in there. And Gilly, I might just get you to move the, the screen. And this is basically an example of some of the care which we did for pre-diabetic patients. So as I said earlier, we know 
what medicines our patients are on. We kind of know their patient journey. We can nearly identify the patients who are going to become diabetic uh, from, the, from their medical history. And we invited those pre-diabetic patients in for a scan. At this stage, we did 120 patients in, in this particular uh, screening. And 30% of patients in this instance had elevated sugar and needed other um, intervention and needed to be referred into a diabetic clinic, which we did. We collaborated with the diabetic center in uh, the Matter Hospital. And th I think there's three, you know, five patients in this actually had type one diabetes whenever they were referred in. And they did not know. They knew they were tired. They knew that they were thirsty. They had all of the symptoms, but they did not join those dots. Um, and only for the screening, you know, th they were, you know, they were causing all sorts of harm to their health. So again, it's a great example of how actually with working with, you know, like-minded healthcare professionals, we can really do fantastic things in terms of intervention and really empower our patients to actually take better control of their health. Does that make sense? In terms of vaccines then, you know, obviously pharmacists have been involved with their GP colleagues in the HLC in rolling out vaccines. Um, I think up until the end of September, we did almost 1.1 million COVID vaccines, which was great to be involved in the, the positive side of fighting the pandemic. 20% um, of the people vaccinated in Ireland last year for flu were done, it was administered by pharmacists, and that was the highest year in year growth. So we had 1,600 pharmacies, almost 85% of uh, pharmacies actually involved in the flu vaccine program last year, which is fantastic to see. So obviously, this is really accessible, really convenient, and it's helped obviously immunization rates here in Ireland. So really playing a part in terms of vaccines, which again, is taking the burden off hospitals and and delivering a much better patient care at the end of the day. And Gilly, I might just get you to move it forward. I think a few people have mentioned medicine compliance. Now we see this every single day and um, we hear from our patients why they're not taking medicine. So um, I think the last gentleman who spoke talked about, you know, is it behavior? Is it actually um, education around this? It's a multiple of different things from talking to patients um, and it's complex and every patient is different why they don't take their medicines. But the latest WHO figures will say that 50 percent of patients don't take their medicine absolutely actively in time. There is a number of interventions that we have done in terms of blister pack and tablets. We, can, we, we know who actually from the data from our um, dispensing systems, we know who is the most non-adherent patients and we can identify those patients using compliance tools like this or even through an app and a push push notification or in some cases when patients go on to a new medicine and we know that they're a non-adhered patient we will actually get our pharmacist teams to call them to phone them after two days after four days after seven days after a week you know after two weeks to get them into a pattern of actually compliance and the reason for that is because we know whenever they adhere to their medications that they will have better healthcare outcomes. And also, we're now teaming up with Health Beacon. I'm sure people on this call um, have heard of Health Beacon. But this is a new adherence, a new compliance um, process for actually um, injectables. So the device will tell you to actually inject um, at particular times, which is fantastic to see because then people who are using these injectable, usually high-tech medicines, when they go back to see their consultant in, in the hospital, the consultant knows that they have actually been adherent and are taking their medication. So I might move this on. And this is just a brief slide. It was a survey that was, that was done by the IPU and actually Pfizer around actually non-compliance of medicines. And just to show, like, every condition is different. They, they tested against, um, they looked at asthmatics, they looked at diabetics, people with cardiovascular. And really, the statistics are are pretty average in terms of saying somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of patients are compliant which is about 30 percent of patients why they're not compliant it is a multitude of reasons it could be um as simple as i don't like the side effects it could be my neighbor told me that um they, these tablets are going to cause weight gain it could be all sorts of different um reasons why they don't take it and our role i suppose as pharmacists to educate around that and to explain to patients actually you know what the truth of it because there's so much misinformation out there about medication and to work to find solutions with their healthcare providers i might get you to move on um gilly
Sorry. Thanks, Gilly. I don't know if I lost the connection there for a second. Um, so how is pharmacy involved, evolving and how can we help? Well, during the pandemic, as I said at the beginning, one good thing that actually came out of the pandemic in terms of community pharmacy was the Minister of Health changed the legislation and allowed us to accept digital prescriptions for the first time. And this has been an absolute game changer for us as pharmacists because it means now that suddenly the piece of paper that we had pre-pandemic, that... that it, the whole shift is away from the prescription, the physical prescription, and it's much more towards the patient because now the whole administration is so much easier. So, but that was a fantastic intervention. It was, you know, something we've been calling for for years and years and years in community pharmacy, and I'm sure our GP colleagues and hospital colleagues were calling for it as well, but there's so much more we can do now. We cannot let um, going back um, post-pandemic you know, to not create an innovation in this. Because if we have integrated technology that links us to other um, healthcare providers, be that GPs or be that hospitals and consultants, I mean, it's just so much better because a patient, then we have a whole picture of the patient and everybody can communicate effectively instead of what can happen between hospitals and pharmacy today is phone calls about certain medicines. It, you know, we... Technology is a great enabler and we must, must push forward with this. Gilly, I might get you just to move to the next slide. So some innovation that has happened throughout the pandemic in our world. Um, I guess when patients were cocooning and these were patients who had chronic illnesses at the very beginning, um, they really felt and, and patients were really compliant in this and they were staying at home, but they really, really missed seeing their pharmacist. If you think about how many times people come in day to day to see community pharmacists, they were you know, watching the news, absolutely petrified, scared of getting the virus and, and really missing that interaction, that relationship. So we quickly set up the first ever video pharmacist here in Ireland in our business um, where we were using the same HSE portal to, in order to connect to patients. So if a patient was concerned about their medicine or maybe was started on something else or just wanted to talk to us, we could do that face-to-face -face interaction. We also teamed up with Web Doctor um, to launch an online doctor because a lot of our GP colleagues just couldn't couldn't cope and uh, they were dealing with so many um, testing cases and whatnot so patients couldn't access um, the, the GP at all and so we teamed up with um, Web Doctor to be able to deliver that and as I said before because then we had been able to accept digital prescriptions suddenly then we could actually because it was all digital we could actually um, get that into our logistics channel as Mary talked about before where we're actually delivering all over Ireland. So suddenly now we could talk to patients at the tip of Donegal, um, have their prescription from their GP, have a video call with them and get that out to them um, if, if they were staying with family members or whatever. So it was a real game changer um, and continues to be so. And from that, I suppose, because we've embraced all of these digital services, we have quickly learned actually that so many patients pre-pandemic actually could have availed with all of these digital services all along because maybe they just cannot get out of their home or maybe even mums with lots of young children um, that, 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 you know, just don't, can't come into the pharmacy, can't, you know, park and get everybody out, that, there are, that they find digital services on some occasions so much more um, accessible, so much more easier to do and so much more easier to engage in. So from that, we've been able to launch a whole suite of other digital services. And some great examples is somebody mentioned earlier about podiatrists. Now you can see an online podiatrist at Mars and, and have your feet checked. Um, you can now speak to an online physiotherapist and, and do your pelvic floor muscles, a whole program on this digitally um, with great, great results. We're about to launch an online, would you believe it, dentist. Who would have thought that you could see your dentist online? But it turns out that almost 70% of consultations with your dentist actually is just to look in and, and to see whether you actually need some intervention. So I suppose COVID has propelled us um, into this whole new world where actually we can deliver a lot of these services actually digitally. And it does suit patients. Um, and then they can get the follow-up one-on-one care should they need it after that. And if we can move on just to the next slide. So really, it's, it, it is, I, I suppose my message is, it is 
for, I think we are moving into a much more integrated healthcare system where the patient needs to stay at the centre of everything. And we need to be working with our colleagues, um, be those GPs, secondary care, dietitians, so many other healthcare professionals that maybe we were working in silos before. Now we need to be working much more um, as part of the team. And when we do that, the patient outcomes is so much more significantly better. So we might just move to the last slide, I think. So what does the future hold? I suppose for me, it is about how can we break down the barriers to allow the patient to be to have better access to to healthcare professionals, and in our case, it obviously um, the community pharmacist. For us as a profession, we need to free up um, our administration burden by just embracing more technologies. And why do we need to do that? If we do that, then we can be much more patient facing in a community pharmacy. If we're not in the back checking things all of the time and, and, and going on to different portals to check GMS numbers and all of the rest, technology should be able to do that to free up us and so that we can release our skills. Why we went to college for all these years, all of our learning, all of our knowledge, so we can bring that to the patient and we can talk to the patient. Um, and, and with that then, you know, with sharing our knowledge, that can absolutely empower patients with better information. There's so many other things that are done outside of Ireland and the NHS and, and our closest colleagues in the UK, Canada have fantastic um, different clinical services. So we need to look worldwide at what's been done in terms of best practice and bring that to Ireland. At the end of the day, we're such an innovation, innovative state here and with the right minds thinking around a table, I think there's so much more that we can do really for patients. So we have everything in our, in our, at our fingertips in pharmacy, a lot of the data to identify not only those patients who have chronic illnesses, but actually patients who may be on a journey to, to chronic illnesses. And so for me, it's really about catching people early, using that information so that they, they're called in for screening, that they can be checked. It gives huge peace of mind to patients, even who might be worried about maybe something that their mum or dad had, and they're worried about it, they want to have a check. That gives them a huge amount of peace of mind. Or if they do have high cholesterol or high blood pressure, that we're referring them on to then our GP colleagues for early intervention, really. So it is about collaboration, and it is about um, empowering our patients so that our patients then, once they have the information, can take better care of their health. So last, I would like you all just to think pharmacy first. Um, you know, pharmacists are highly skilled um, healthcare professionals. We're really accessible, as I said, in the, in, in the community setting. Um, and we can do so much more with our other, other, other colleagues. I often say we're gatekeepers in the healthcare system. We see patients probably most frequently out of every other healthcare professional. And we can free up time um, with our GPs so that they can deliver much more specialist care and our cons uh, hospital colleagues in, in, in the hospitals that they can actually spend more quality time with the patients who really need to see them. We need to, as, as a profession, really step it up in terms of education and awareness and to be talking much more to view, I suppose, your community pharmacy, not as a place you only go to whenever you're sick, but actually the place that you go to in order to stay well. And ultimately, that will give so many better healthcare interventions and it'll make sure that patients do understand what is going on or what they maybe are at risk of so that they can take better care of their health. And we know from our latest survey done with the IPU that patients want this now. You know, I think if COVID taught us anything, it is that we're all human at the end of the day. We're all so scared of, of this virus and people now have reprioritized their health. And, and so we know that patients do want us as a profession, as your community pharmacist, to get much more involved. And, and patients now, you know, are embracing vaccines. They're embracing um, screening services. So we need to continue that great work that we're doing really to um, empower our patients and encourage them to care of health. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ines, so much. Massively appreciated. And again, showing the power of community pharmacy. I'm very grateful to it. Everybody, um, thanks, Una. We've got three more fantastic speakers and we want to give everybody equal time. So the next person 
is Kevin Connolly. He's going to be talking about the importance of vaccination, an area that has been controversial. There's the people who absolutely believe in it, and there's some people who absolutely don't believe in it. Um, Kevin passed through life serendipitously. He qualified from UCD and, and then worked as a consultant pediatrician in Port Uncala. And I love his um, his resume um, working through the um, National Drugs Advisory Board and uh, through the National Immunization Advisory Committee, which we're very proud of to host an, an RCPI. But obviously important to him, the Balance Low Under 10 Soccer Street League Championship and two women mini marathons. Fair juice to you, Kevin. I've always enjoyed the guys who run in the mini marathon. Just can't wait to hear what you're going to say about vaccination. And thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, um, I'm conscious of time. So if Woody Allen could summarise the novel War and Peace as it's about Russia, I'm going to summarise our immune system germs and vaccines as enabling a long, healthy life. I've used the word germs here in, in this context to uh, um, talk about bacteria and viruses, which are pathogens, uh, meaning which cause disease and which are vaccine preventative infections. Next, please. It's a battle between us and them. Bacteria evolved about two billion years ago. We've only been around for about one and a half million years ago, but we've had an ongoing conflict with them. For us to survive, we have to be able to tolerate what are called, I call benign germs, and they're the microbes which cover our skin, eyes, ears, nose, lungs, and in our gut. And it's very reasonable to say that we couldn't survive without these because they, they help the immune system develop and help it function. They also help uh, protect us against these pathogens. And finally, they help us digest some foods. And so that's our immune system. Uh, sorry, that's the, the positive. Um, no, sorry, I've just lost. No, yeah. Um, can you go back one slide, please? Yeah. Um, so we need to be able not only to tolerate the goodies, but we uh, need to be able to reject or destroy the baddies. The germs in their hand to survive need to be able to spread into us, in the case of human disease, and to get out, out of our body. Um, to be able to spread into the next hole. Next slide. Thank you. This is a, a very uh, non-comprehensive diagram of how the bacteria get in. They get in through eyes, nose, with the, um, the diseases they cause, mouth, reproductive system, hair follicles, insect bites, cuts, and so on. Next slide. Uh, now, in order to get to protect ourselves, we have evolved very, very effective defenses. Next slide. And this is a, a diagram showing where those defenses are. It's like sentries keeping an eye out for thieves or enemy soldiers. And you notice where the, the defences are, the mucous membrane around in our, the tissue inside our nose and our mouth and our tonsils, which is where a lot of the bugs get in. The lymph vessels, um, which are the glands that when the, the um, bug, the antigens, which are parts of the bugs that cause antibodies to deform, be formed, when they get into our body, the thymus gland, skin, the glands under our arms, our spleen, and our bone marrow, they're placed it very near where the bacteria, the germs get into us and how they attack through our body. Next, please. Now, the immune systems, that's in the plural, there's two immune systems, the innate, which is the one we're born with, and the adaptive one. Next slide. The innate immune system is present before birth and 
helped by the mother's bacteria and viruses to develop. So it's there when a baby is born and it works very rapidly. It's like the, the guards emergency response unit. Once a signal comes in that the, the germ is there, the defences run out towards the site of the infection. And it includes our skin, which is a uh, physical barrier, our tears, mucus, acid in the stomach. And what happens is that the immune defense cells surround, digest the germs and inform the adaptive system that you need to get the lead out and help protect me. Next slide, next slide, yeah. The adaptive immune system's job is to make specific antibodies. Now, the word antigen is the part of a bacteria or virus which causes the antibodies to be, uh, or to be um, formed. But they take several days. So there's always a delay in the adaptive immune system being able to start protecting us. After the first time we're exposed to something, the adaptive system makes memory cells, which are present in our spleen and our bone marrow, and which are dormant until the next infection comes. And an alarm goes very quickly into the, let's say the bone marrow, and there's a very rapid response against the uh, germ which caused the first exposure. Next slide. Now, this is a diagram. I want to make two points about this. It's to show that the, the two immune systems work in harmony. They help each other. And the, the lighter uh, circle on the right, the macrophage, natural kill. Macrophage means a big eater, a big cell which can eat uh, germs. Natural killer cell is what it says on the label. The dendritic cell presents the antigen, the piece of the virus or bacteria, into the to the T cells and the adaptive immune system. And there are helper T cells and memory T cells, both of which uh, work together. So it's a it's an overall system which has been finely tuned and which works very well if people are healthy. Next slide, please. Oh, next one. Now, traditional vaccines, the ones that we all have got, diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough and so on, take up 10 years maybe from the idea of the vaccine going through all the different preliminary trials, the bigger trials and so on, and then going through the regulatory process, they take up to 10 years. But you may recall that the first uh, isolation of the antigen against uh, cars, COVID, not, uh, sorry, yeah, God, I should remember this, the COVID um, uh, pathogen was identified in March 2020. And by December, the first vaccines were being administered. So in other words, nine months it took. And it's estimated now as the technology is advanced, it will be possible to make MRA vaccines against up to 100 different disease-causing organisms, against anti auto-inflammatory diseases, which were talked about later, and anti-cancer vaccines. So it's very, very exciting. And the diagram shows the purpley slide. You look familiar with the diagram of the COVID uh, virus. And the little hammer-like thing on the outside is the antigen, the spike protein. And the bottom left-hand orange circled one is the mRNA, as in mRNA vaccine. And what that does is it gets into the body and the blue, the human cell, the macrophage, ingests the particle, the, virus, the vaccine particle, takes out the messenger cell. And the messenger says, this is the message, turn on the production line and produce antibodies. So that's the new technology 
which, as I mentioned, is, has huge potential. Next slide, please. Now, the vaccine works. Next slide. They do work, and these three uh, diagrams, I'd start at the top right one, polio, um, the older people in the audience will remember that the 1956 All-Ireland hurling final was cancelled because of an outbreak of polio in Cork, uh, and it was cancelled for three weeks. Polio has been eliminated in Ireland and was nearly eliminated in the world. Now, that's not the case at the moment, but that's outside the, the um, ambit of my talk. The uh, diagram on the left shows invasive meningococcal disease. Ireland had one of the highest incidence of uh, meningitis in Europe. And when the first vaccine was introduced in 2001, you can see the bars gradually lessening and lessening. The meningitis B vaccine was introduced in 2016, and the incidence has significantly declined. Now, the bottom right-hand uh, figure, if you can go on to the next slide, please. That shows the number of measles notifications since 1948. And you can see there was regular, every three, four years, uh, outbreaks of measles, which infected the non-immune people. They passed on the virus to other people. And in some ways it was active immunization by getting ill. The problem was there's a significant likelihood of being significantly ill and dying from measles. And the first, the measles vaccine was introduced there, you can see in 1985. Uh, MMR, that's the three uh, triple live vac uh, vaccine was introduced later on. And then you can see now in the latter part of the graph that measles has become very rare apart from in 2001 when there was the measles scare. Next slide, please. Now, you've heard a few talks on people at increased risk. And these are some of the conditions which put people at high risk of infection because of an ineffective immune system. They include those who are immunocompromised, say from treatment or from certain diseases, cancer, chronic heart, kidney, lung, liver, and neurological disease, diabetes, people with severe intellectual disability or with moderate disability, and in particular, you may not realize, people with Down syndrome are at increased risk of infection. Uh, overweight people and people with some severe mental illness. I won't go into any more of the conditions, but the chapters of the Immunization Guidelines for Ireland, Chapter 3 and Chapter 5A, are a very good source of information. And I'd give the, the um, web address at the end of this. Next, please. Now, the vaccines for those at increased risk, I mentioned the certain conditions, but also the elderly, because as we age, the efficiency and effectiveness of our immune system wanes. So we need more vaccines. And you should receive the recommended vaccines. Now, some people shouldn't be given live vaccines, with some exceptions. And what I'll mention is the chickenpox vaccine for those who have had cancer treatment or who are in remission from something like leukemia and who have not previously had chickenpox infection. Non-live vaccines are safe, but they may not result in a, an adequate response because of a, a, a less efficient immune system. Next, please. Now, how to enhance your immunity rapidly, eat well, be active, healthy weight, enough sleep, quit smoking, avoid too much alcohol. Next, please. Yeah, vaccinate. Next. Now, to sum up, Immune system is your defense against infections and taking care of yourself helps your immune system take care of you. Next, please. 
these are the links and these slides are available online. I'm not sure when they'll be put up by the college, but they're available online. So if you Google immunization guidelines for Ireland, you'll have access to all the uh, information about all vaccine preventable diseases. And then the chapter three there is the specific vaccine uh, chapter dealing with immunization of Im immunocompromised persons. Next slide, please. Thank you. There seems to be a little bit of an issue there um, in that. Is there an issue? Are we okay, Kevin? You Thank you everybody for your patience today. It couldn't actually be an online to an online presentation unless we had a couple of technical issues. Kevin, you're okay there, aren't you, to start to keep going? Sorry, Kevin. where did you lose me? Kevin, Just one slide ago, I think, Kevin. Oh, sorry, Ed, uh, the, the links, apologies. Okay, I haven't controlled, Gilly. Can you move back to the, the slide where you lost me? <laughs> I think we all saw okay. those slides, Mary. I think we all saw that slide. Perfect. As I said, okay, it's not so, an online presentation unless we have some technical issues. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin, do you want to keep going or? So with that, I'm going to then pass on to Noel. Yep. So everybody, um, so we've talked about all the other aspects of the multidisciplinary team, and this has been a fantastic presentation. We've got two more amazing speakers. In order to be respectful to the people who've given up their time to talk today and to hear about the importance of exercise and diet, we're going to hold off on questions and try and post them to you, um, written questions into the box in between the speakers. So the next presentation is going to be Noel, and I have, because everything's going so well today, I've actually lost everything um, that I was talking about. So actually, Noel, Noel is going to talk to us about a, pa a program that he's passionate about, an XWELL program, about the importance of exercise, something that we all know we should be doing, and we are all probably not doing Doing enough, and I think consistently we saw we're not doing the 140 minutes. So, having been persuaded by everybody else to to get our vaccinations, to drink water, to kind of look after our mental health, and to look after ourselves, now we're going to be reminded of why we need to walk this evening after this presentation. Noel, hand over to you, and thank you for your patience. Thanks, Mary, um, and I will be brief. Um, so fantastic stuff tonight about the overview from GPs about the importance of self-management as a sort of a holistic overview, then focusing on kidney disease as one example of a specific illness which embraces all those needs. And I'm now going to focus on one intervention which applies to all chronic illnesses. Next slide. So chronic illness for the public, what we mean by this is not contagious illnesses. These are illnesses which are with us for a long time by definition, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, chronic pain, liver disease, all these things. Um, they affect 40% of the entire population. They affect 85% of people over the age of 65. They consume 75% of the entire annual health spend. The issue is getting worse because of an aging population with increased lifespans. And the biggest issue that goes with chronic illness is the associated loneliness that goes with it. Next slide. And next, so, what we see in, go again please Gilly, I should highlight that, people with long-term illness become less active than the rest of us. Uh, we all get less active as we get older, we shouldn't, but we do. Um, the reasons why people with chronic illness become less active than the rest of the population include fear of exercise because people mistakenly think exercise is bad for their condition. In particular, people with long-term illness very commonly become afraid of experiencing breathlessness. And of course, there's nothing wrong with breathlessness once it is not extreme and once it's not extreme it is both good for you and believe it or not enjoyable 
And the third reason people become less active is because they're told to be, which is terrible advice given for good reasons, I suppose, by family and friends and doctors, but it's awful advice. Next. The net effect of that is reduced fitness, all components of it, strength, aerobic fitness, flexibility, balance. Each of those has practical implications on day-to-day -day functions like standing up off the toilet, standing up in the bed, from the bed, getting out of the car, putting your shoe on, doing the housework, doing the gardening. All of these things are fundamentally related to basic aspects of fitness. And that leads to reduced mobility and loss of independence. And a big aspect of chronic illness is the hidden burden on families and carers, both emotional, financial and time, of a chronic illness. Next. That leads on to social isolation, loneliness, lack of enthusiasm, poor mental health. That leads on, next please, to lack of motivation, fear of exercise, and next, it gets worse. It just starts again. The good news is this can all be fixed. This reducing physical conditioning, which is common to all chronic illnesses, can be fixed by appropriate exercise without having to fix the illness, that's the point, without having to fix the illness, thereby having an incredible transformative effect on quality of life consistently. We see it in every cohort that we deal with. Next slide. So the rehab challenge with chronic illness is that we have um, the hospital system where people who are sick are, next slide, or uh, go again, Gilly, we have a chronic illness cohort that is too well to be in hospital but not well enough for independent exercise and that's why we need in community settings clinical exercise programs to cater for these cohorts next and that allows people to flow from the hospital into a protected environment of safe exercise next and from there to independent exercise next and backwards into the health system as needed next slide so the guidelines for exercise participation, which apply to everybody, including those with illness, um, how much exercise, every little helps, once we're not sitting down all the time, it's helpful. And the difference between sitting down during the Late Late Show and standing up at every ad break just to get a glass of water, the difference on your health is actually profound. Simply not sitting is profoundly beneficial for your health. The experts want us doing five 30-minute sessions of aerobic exercise every week. That's the target, okay? Second question is what type of exercise? There's three types, aerobic exercise, which is the getting breathless type, and that is hugely beneficial to your cardiovascular health. Health, Strength work, which is really important, particularly in women who have less muscle mass than men in the first place. If your strength falls progressively, more pressure comes on your, jump, your bones and joints, that's not good. And the third form of exercise that's in all of the classes we offer is core stability and balance, which is really, really helpful in people who are getting a bit more mature and are maybe getting a little bit frail and unsteady on their feet to prevent falls. The third aspect of exercise is how hard should it be? Very simple answer to that. If you're exercising hard enough, you will feel a little breathless. And the way to monitor that is the talk test. If the exercise is at the right intensity, you will be able to talk to your partner. If you're able to sing a song, it's too easy. If you're gasping, it's too hard. It's that simple. And the research shows that that's just as accurate as wearing gadgets to monitor or measure heart rates or display it. Next slide. For people prescribing exercise, um, doctors, it needs to be a core part of everything we do. We need to document and discuss behavior or physical activity. Simply discussing it impacts on behavior, creating the awareness in the surgery. And we as doctors have the knowledge about how to do it correctly. Gilly, I'm gonna skip the next slide if you don't mind. Just go through it, please. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There. For the patient taking up exercise who hasn't done it in a while, who may have an illness and may feel I shouldn't be doing this, you should be confident. It has a role to play in your health. Everybody can do something. Everybody can do some degree of exercise. It gives you control over your own health. It builds a social network. It builds resilience. And it is incredibly enjoyable. Incredibly. Next slide. So Expo Medical is what I'm involved in. It's a social enterprise. We offer structured medical-led exercise programs in community settings for people with chronic illness. This is called secondary prevention. There are three pillars of what we do. One is the exercise itself, which includes the three components that I've mentioned, and it accommodates all abilities. And we've gone away from prescribing specific programs for different illnesses to prescribing exercise based on what we call functional ability, just how well are you, no matter what your illness is, 
not what industry you have. There are some exceptions to that, which I won't mention just now. The second pillar is social interaction, because when you exercise in groups, it treats this loneliness issue around chronic illness dramatically well. By getting out and meeting people, it is simply exhilarating. And the third pillar about what we do is measuring the impact. We might feel it's great, but we need to show it to you and show it to the HSC. Next. So Exwell, uh, we operate down 22 centres around the country. We, we're in some step-down units. We're in a home care provider um, project, which is really interesting because in people who are using home care services are at risk of three big transitions which are life transforming and expensive. The first is becoming bed bound, the second is being admitted to hospital, and the third is being admitted to long-term residential care. And introducing physical activity into the daily activity these people can defer or postpone or eliminate those extraordinarily stressful transitions. We have a very interesting pilot project finished with adolescents, they get chronic illness as well. We have an interesting online model, which is um, pre-recorded exercise with an algorithm for self-managing progression within levels. We're now seeing over 1,300 visits a week. We are developing good links with the HSE who are funding our program in many places. And the referral for doctors is very easy via health link or via health mail. Next. So the pathway very quickly of getting involved with clinical exercise with Exwell is initially referral from various sources, hospitals, GPs, social prescribers. Then there's an induction process in which the, um, the program is explained and baseline testing is done. Then you take part in the program, be it, be it online or face-to-face. Or -face. Some people drop out. And we have to have an easy re-entry method without sort of giving out to people if they have for some reason dropped out. And hopefully we have a lifelong relationship which might be continued involved with Exwell or it might be coming back for a few weeks every year. And along the way we do retesting and give reports to the patients and to their referrers. Okay, next. I think I'll skip that slide, Gilly, because it's just a bit, comp I I'll summarize it later on. And again, skip that one. So what I wanted to say was, one of the things that commonly concerns people with chronic illness is pain. Many, many people, no matter what their illness is, have pain. And when they refer to Exwell, it may not be because of the pain. They may come with their heart disease, but they have a bad knee or a bad back as well. And what this slide summarizes is that on the left, the green bar shows that 65% of people with chronic illness attending our program have pain every day. But the interesting thing is, if we ask them, what happened to your pain since you started, which would have been four weeks earlier, 95%, the first two bar, bars between them, either their pain improves or it does not change. Only in one in 20 does the pain get worse. There's two important messages here. One, pain is not a barrier to taking part. And number two, it may get better. Next slide. So I just want to show you the people we deal with. Let's just fly through these again, Gilly, please. We do outdoor, we do adaptive stuff. The social interaction is really important. Group exercise indoors with or without the mask being worn properly all abilities all shapes all sizes and it is magnificently impactful we call it exhilarating medicine it is profoundly satisfying that one there is in the um the salubis grounds of the sean mcdermott street church where we met asylum seekers and all sorts of other people so the key findings around clinical exercise and i suppose one thing i'd like to say is that I think empowerment is great and all that, but in actual fact, my belief is that there's a significant proportion of our population who need to be guided, supported, arms around their shoulders to deliver interventions, not to talk about them or to try to empower them. I think empowerment, it's very interesting to, to talk about the influence of behavior on outcomes, but the behavior may not be well linked to attitudes or, empower, or sort of advocacy. Behavior is often brought about by actually making it happen in a structured way. So the key findings are exercise is the single most important intervention I think you can undertake for healthy aging. It works and it works quickly. It works within six weeks. The, the six minute time trial and the sit, sit to stand which are measures of aerobic fitness and, and strength, the changes seen in those outcomes exceed what is called the minimal clinically important difference. That is, it has a direct impact on daily activities. And here's the key point. The greatest relative changes occur in those who start off the frailest. The very people who may lack the confidence to try it because they're frail. They are the people who actually do best. 
Pain is not a barrier and it's great fun. That's me done. Thank you. Wow, Noel, thank you so much. You're, there's the, the talk about exercise and Noel sprinted through that. Um, and I loved what you said about people being scared that they're not, that because they're exercising, they're able to breathe and think that's their condition. And it's actually the, the, the idea of the breath test and being able to check yourself. I love the idea about people who were frail. My father has gone through this experience myself and just seeing the, the goals that were important to him of being able to get walk onto the farm with the dogs, which he couldn't have done before and it's because people like you have made a difference to him. Thank you so much. Um, we see it in gestational diabetes all the time. People think if you're exercising, you need to do your one hour hit test where in fact a 15 minute walk down the road will make a difference in your glucose measurements and more importantly, make you feel better. And that's the, those goals that are really important. So we've had a fabulous night tonight. Last but in no means least, one of the most important members of the multidisciplinary team, Kira, the um, the dietitian. Like I work with a, a state with, with diabetes and pregnancy, and I can tell you, the dietitians are a core part of our care of people with diabetes. Um, and I'm not saying this either, Kira, because you're the last person on the day. You are here is a senior dietitian to the National Diabetes Self Management and Education. Education Support Office and HSC. She worked as a senior community dietitian in type 2 diabetes prevention and management in Kerry and is part of the team of dietitians who developed and deliver a self-management education course. She's over 10 years experience. She's a PhD in the area of maternal diet during pregnancy in, in um, UCD and in the National Maternity Hospital, I remember years ago. And she resides now in Killarney in her husband and three little boys and we miss her from Hollis Street, but it's great to see her again today, Kira. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mary, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for staying on to wait until we finished up. Um, so as Mary introduced me, I work in a self-management office. So basically what I do is I develop courses and I train dietitians to deliver those courses while also delivering some myself. And tonight I'm going to be brief and I'm going to basically give you little snippets of what information we cover in those courses, um, just so people are a little bit more informed going forward. We've heard a lot about self-management this evening, but I just love this anal analogy of the car. So in the driver's seat, we have the patient or the person in the example um, of the courses I'm talking about is uh, people with type 2 diabetes. So the person driving the car is the person living with type 2 diabetes and the person in the driver's seat or in the passenger seat is the healthcare professional. So really our job is guiding and supporting um, the, the, the person living with diabetes, but they are ideally in control of their own condition. And I suppose an important element of self-management is also knowing when to seek help, when to turn to that healthcare professional. I also like this <clears throat> analogy of the iceberg. So on average, in a typical year, a person living with a chronic condition will spend three hours with the healthcare professional. So therefore, they're managing their own condition for the remaining 8,757 hours. So what kind of courses do we have on offer in Ireland for people living with type 2 diabetes? Some of you might have heard of the course Expert, um, which was a UK based course that we were delivering in Ireland. That has been replaced with our own Irish owned course called Discover Diabetes. Um, we also have Desmond and uh, our colleagues in Diabetes Ireland run code in certain pockets of the country. All of these courses are free for people with um, type 2 diabetes or their family members. Um, in COVID, they've all been adapted to online and I, I do see a blended options going forward into the future. There will be face to face um, courses coming out again, which is very exciting. But also, I think the online courses will remain. Um, they, they're generally delivered over a core number of weeks, four or six weeks with um, follow up options, um, giving a package of care for approximately 12 months. And people, people can come back if they've done Discover or Desmond many years ago, they can come back and do it again. So what treatments work for type 2 diabetes? And we, we cover a lot of um, different topics in the course. So we all know that diet is really important. And I will touch on that in a few minutes. Also sitting less, as we've heard earlier on tonight. And I definitely need to get out of my chair fairly quickly after this. Um, moving more, managing our weight. 
staying uh, you know away from tobacco as much as possible and uh, watching our alcohol intake minding our minds and watching out for stress in our lives and that's a, a new component to some of our courses now and we we realize the impact of stress on our diabetes management and it's a really really um helpful component knowing what medicines are that we should be taking um knowing the names of those medicines and how they affect our diabetes and our general health and knowing the numbers what numbers we should be looking out for and what tests the doctors are actually doing when we go for our blood tests um these are just some of the the things to, let's just go back and i suppose think about food for a moment so we generally go back to basics and why why do we eat in the first place so we eat for survival we we eat for energy and obviously we eat for vital nutrients that are giving us um our body's ability to function normally and also um providing additional needs in times of growth or um development our food is made up of a number of different nutrients. Hopefully you're all familiar with these. So carbohydrate, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, water. Do we know um, which nutrient has the greatest impact on blood glucose levels? Yes, we do. We know that our carbohydrate is the one that can influence our blood glucose levels the most. So our courses do spend a, a quite a lot of time focusing car on carbohydrates and learning about where they are in the diet. So <clears throat> We have starchy foods and we have sugary foods, and these are all our carbohydrates. So our starchy foods will be things like our breads, pasta, rice, potatoes, and all of our grains. Our natural sugars then are found in our milk and our yogurt and our fruit. And then obviously our added sugars are, are present in confectionery items. But at the end of the day, when our body has done all the, all the jobs and digestion and absorption, it's they're all broken down into, into glucose or a simple sugar unit. And really knowing where carbohydrates are in, in, in our own diet and knowing which sources are maybe healthier and the quantity of, of how much carbohydrate we're consuming and making changes to that can really have a positive effect on, on a person's diabetes. We never really strive for a carbohydrate free diet. And, you know, that's often, <clears throat> I suppose, the place in the course is dispelling a lot of myths about um, foods and about diets in relation to diabetes. We spend a lot of time discussing um, what foods are essential for our health. And, you know, there isn't a, exactly a list of you cannot have these foods or no foods or bad foods. Um, it's all about how often and how much we're, we're eating um, of them. So we'd never cut carbohydrates carbohydrates out completely why not they they are our fuel source they also many of our carbohydrate foods particularly our whole grain foods um, and our fruit provide us with a lot of fiber we could talk all night about that on its own and that's really important for our gut health and also our heart health as well Obviously, weight, um, it's well known that weight can influence our, our type 2 diabetes and losing weight and even losing as much as 5% can have a huge positive effect on, on type 2 diabetes. Um, while weight loss isn't recommended for everybody, it is often part of the plan for many, many patients that come to our diabetes support courses. So as much as 5% loss can reduce our A1C, that lovely blood test that the GP will do that looks at the average glucose in our blood over the previous three months can lower blood pressure lower cholesterol and improve our energy and our mood but we know in reality that a lot of factors affect our weight and how much weight we've gained over the course of our life so our genes our biology the amount of sleep we get the medications we're taking our mental health food environment workplace environment etc so we spend a lot of time in these courses um, learning about what factors affect each individual person. Standing moving breaks. My talk isn't going to be long enough to do that, but this is a really inbuilt um, element of our programs and um, following on from what Noel said you know we some 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 programs do actually do physical movement as well and everyone can do something as he said so a lot of our um, movement breaks can be done from a chair for for people who can't actually get out of their seat um, and then for those who can stand up we can we can do other movements um, so it's not just all about food on these programs it's also about moving our bodies Another, I suppose, big component of, of the diabetes support courses is taking the time to stop and think. And I suppose it's really important when you're living with a chronic condition to do that. Um, 
we know that people who do take the time to reflect and self-monitor um, generally have more success in managing their condition. So somebody living with type 2 diabetes, they have the time to think about, you know, what changes they'd like to make to their diabetes, what is working well at the moment, and what am I struggling with? And this is a core component of, of the diabetes support courses that we come back to week after week. Um, and, you know, attendees are prompted with different worksheets on, on how to make a change um, and we find you know as as Kathy the, the patient's experience mentioned with the living well program setting small realistic targets and small changes and coming back and reflecting on them each week can be really really um, a powerful way to to get started in in terms of behavior change so how, how to refer to a, to a course. So the HSC website, and I have the link here, hsc.ie forward slash diabetes courses, uh, where people can self-refer to a diabetes course. Um, our colleagues at HSC Live on the, on the phone number on the slide, 1800 700 700, can also direct people to the course. Um, and then people living with type 2 diabetes can, can link with their local GP or their practice nurse for um, referral into their local dietetics service in the community. As I mentioned, the courses are free. They are also fun. They're not, um, you know, sometimes people have a fear that, you know, maybe it's going to be a bit like school, but it's it's really not. Um, often what happens is we try and get people into the first week or the first session and they're usually hooked at that stage and they keep coming back. Down here in Killarney, we have people coming back year after year with, with their health results forms and their numbers and they're, they're, they're knowing what to ask their doctors because they've learned so much. Um, so if you have a patient or if you are somebody who's living with type 2 diabetes, please have a look at the, the website and look up what diabetes courses are, are in your area. Okay, that's me done. Thank you so much, everybody. Kira, thank you very much. Um, as I said, working in a diabetes clinic, I can tell you, first of all, Kira's PhD thesis is in the room next to mine, and I like to look at it because it's a fantastic piece of work, but also just how important the dietitian is. It's like they're an integral member of the team. And quite often the dietitian will find out something that none of the rest of us knew. So I always love that, that they, they sometimes in talking about food, it's such a personal thing that people will talk about. So thank you, everybody. We've gone way over because it's been such an amazing night and we've had so many good speakers. So to summarize and say thank you. Um, today, we've had John Brennan, the GP, reminding us again about the importance of the primary health care practitioners. The GP is the center of care for a lot of people um, and the importance of goals that are important to the person being on your tidy talents committee using your picture of your grandchildren in your in your um in your wallet so that you don't go buy cigarettes. I absolutely love that chunk. Thank you, John, for your time. Do you have any last one minute second thing you want to say? Uh, no, Mary, I mean, just to, you know, reiterate that it's been a great evening. And I think if there's one thing everyone should try and take from it, it's that there's loads of different sources out there and places where you can improve your health and just grab every opportunity you can. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. Um, Kathy Carl is uh, will give us an amazing, inspiring talk about living well. I I hope they've got lots of extra staff on tomorrow because I think they're going to have a lot of people writing into them and saying, and a lot of us are going to be saying, I think maybe you should do this course. Why don't you try this? Because I said, I really want to do it myself. Um, Liam Plant is still here. Liam has given us an excellent example about kidney disease in long-term care. And Liam, certainly I'm going to go and buy drink my litre of water now in a minute because I've been in theatre all day and therefore I'm in clinic and I haven't been drinking my water. So thank you very much for that. Do you have any last minute something to say? One of the things that, can you hear me, Mary? Yeah, please. Can you hear me, Mary? Yep, we're perfect. One of the things uh, that uh, a lot of people out of a certain age ask about the future, right, is, oh gosh, when we're old, who's going to look after us? So, one of the things I've reflected upon, um, I'm obviously much younger than everybody else on this talk, but one of the things I've reflected on is listening to all the different healthcare professionals and patients and perspectives here is that actually we can look after ourselves with a little bit of help. And I, I, I think that if there's any you know, other message and that's come from this session that, you know, we, we worry, we don't worry, well, perhaps we might worry about the future. Who's going to look after us in the future, right? Um, 
Whilst I've been listening here, I have been doing um, isometric exercises <laughs> to stop my muscle bulk falling away further. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to go down to my pharmacist and and say I'm lonely and my wife doesn't speak to me um, and you know the um, the I think it I think it's really important uh, for people to, to say that you know who's going to look after myself I am and I'm not looking for somebody else to look after me but I think I'm delighted to hear that there's so many people in so many different disciplines who can give me a little bit of a steer or give me a little bit of a help from that so uh, I'm really delighted with what I've heard here tonight. Thanks, Liam. Brilliant. Una, everyone's best friend in pharmacy. Una has uh, shown us about the increasing role of pharmacists. Um, I mean, we find them fantastic, I have to say. Pharmacists are always giving great advice for pregnant women. And I love the idea of the fibre scan. I thought that was a tertiary level, Vincent's Hollis, you know, matter kind of thing. I didn't ever think you could do it. Your last thought of the evening, Una. I would just say, you know, engage with your local community pharmacist. You know, we want to be able to help. We are very accessible. Um, so if you have a health concern, if you have a chronic illness or you're worried about developing something, um, you know, talk to them because um, they're there. They want to do, they want to help. There may be a lot of services that are going on in your community pharmacy, but you're not not aware of. Um, so and, and sometimes services are run on specific clinic days maybe not every single day so so ask and um and don't feel alone in whatever condition that you have because very often even in our own business we would run events where we bring together people who are suffering from you know um, chronic illnesses or the last event that we did was actually people who were just recently diagnosed with cancer and there's huge camaraderie in that to be in a room with other people who are going through the same thing as you so maybe your local pharmacy is doing something like that so so just ask ask for the help that you need and um and um you know and community pharmacists all over the country all of our, our colleagues all we want to do is make a difference and be able to help you so and that we've certainly seen that. I have to say, my own pharmacist is absolutely relevant. Uh, Kevin Connolly had reminded us of the importance of vaccines. I'm grateful that I got my flu and COVID booster as a healthcare worker. And remember, if anybody's listening who meets the criteria for the COVID booster, we encourage you to do it. It always reminds me of that fantastic heartbreaking letter by Roald Dahl about his daughter who died of um, measles wasn't it in the 1960s and just reminds us that this is an issue and certainly when I was in India there was two children who died from measles when I was there um, Noel a sprint through exercise um, I'm certainly going to be walking home this evening and not taking the bus but I loved what you said about everyone can improve through their baseline Noel what's your take your last minute thoughts well, just what you said there, Mary, I think for anybody with an illness, there is a tendency to feel and maybe listen to the advice to take it easy mm-hmm. and not push yourself anymore. And that is the wrong advice. And the empowerment stuff is all great. And that will help some people to just get up and go. But for many people, the structure of a place to go and a timetable and friends to go with and people to meet is the perfect environment to get going again and the difference it'll make to your wellness in general is extraordinary perfect thank you and Noel you gave your your email address I believe for people to contact um, and we're very grateful for that because I think this is an amazing program and I absolutely love the idea of it Kira, last but never least we're all going to be eating vegetables and good carbohydrates with our dinner tonight Um, so there'll be I would forget about the fact that I had a packet of sweets at four o'clock to keep me going that didn't happen. No, you you no, also no. there's no bad foods. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, no, there isn't really any bad foods. Some are better than others, obviously, but um <laughs> I think it's a very exciting time at the moment in terms of self-management. Um, there's so many courses available from the Living Well to all of our diabetes, and there will be more coming. There's there's a diabetes prevention program, which is fabulous, and that's coming out, um, a weight management program. So my my advice would be to give, give these things a go. You just don't know what you're going to learn. Um, and how you're going to feel afterwards. And Kathy was um, her talk on how much her life has changed from giving it a go and um, was just so powerful. So um, and little changes to your diet can have a really big um, positive effect on your health. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. I think for me, actually, the symbol of tonight was your fantastic image of the patient, the person, because, of course, people are people. Most yes, of them are it should be person. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
uh, no, that was that was reminding you. So, as you said, like eight thousand hours are in their own time. So yeah. the, the the person being the driver, and we're there as the people to give them a boost and give them. So Noel is giving them all the confidence that you, you can get up and walk around. John is reminding yeah. them that we can do all these things. Una is giving them all the support and medications. And we in the RCPI are very grateful for everybody. So the Royal College of Physicians, I'd like to thank particularly Sinead Murphy, who is our director of, uh, of everything. Sinead's one of these people that does everything in RCPI. Um, she works as a pediatrician in Temple Street, but has organised this fantastic night. And again, as ever, off Mary Horgan. Sinead, do you want to finish off and give the last quote of the night for everyone who's been kind enough to stay with us? Oh, thanks, Pleasure. Mary. So I, I don't want to keep uh, people very long, but just to, to thank you all, all of those watching at home. Um, I, ho I, I know that you'll have learned an awful lot from, from all of the speakers, like Mary said. And to thank you, Mary, for doing such a fantastic job of sharing. No surprise, but a you know, wonderful job. And also not to forget Gilly, who's there in the background, I would say, tearing his hair out <laughs> with our uh, technical inexpertise. Um, so thanks, Gilly, for that. So no, I think that's been a, a, a really uh, a wonderful evening and I'm going to do the same with you, Mary. Uh, walk home fast, eat good things, you know, all of that. And, and I'm sure everybody at home will too. So just thank you very much, everybody. Take care. And good night evening. Good night, everybody.